Some models like to get knocked loose by the 3D printer's nozzle. Z-Hop will fix this by add stringing. But what if there was a better way? Introducing Diagonal Z-Hop. I'm pretty sure I've got a new idea here. I certainly can't find it in any slices. And that thing is Diagonal Z-Hop. The thing is, it might be great or it might be worthless. So in this video, I'm going to explain what it is, how it works, and how you can help me test it to determine its worth. This whole concept started with a show and tell post from my patron Patrick, showing off his completed version of the E3D overhang egg, a true torture test. Patrick is particularly adept at tuning his machines for print quality, as evidenced by this print. I knew this print would be hard, so I sliced it to try out, sending it to the SK tank. If you do attempt this print, and I recommend that you give it a try, it's really important to make sure your bed is clean to give the part the best chance of sticking possible. My first attempt was with zero alterations to my standard profile, which on this machine is 200mm per second feed rate with 5k acceleration. And even with this impressive speed, the printer did an admirable job at the start, but it wasn't long until the egg was knocked loose. For attempt number two, I halved the feed rate to a default of 100 millimeters per second. And again, things looked promising, but ultimately we had the same result. And that's because these are really steep overhangs that tend to curl up on the edges and the nozzle will catch these, knock the object free as it's traveling around. One way to fix this is to focus on part cooling. I looked at the G-code preview and saw that most of the layers were around 11 seconds. So I turned on a setting that allowed the fan to go to 100% anytime the layers were under 15 seconds. Previewing the G-code by looking at the fan speed, we can see that the fan is at 90% or above for the duration of the print. This iteration seems to be getting a bit further than the others, but then I happened to be filming at the critical moment when the print failed. So my next attempt made the part cooling easier by dropping the hot end temperature by 20 degrees. Lower feed rates means less flow required and you can get away with lower temperatures. The underside of the egg looked cleaner, but this still wasn't enough to stop the edges from curling up, followed by yet another failure. Time to get serious and use a slice of feature that I'm normally way too impatient to try, slowing down the layer time automatically, because the slower the nozzle is going, the more time the part cooling fan can blow on the molten plastic. This fifth iteration was noticeably slower to print with the predicted duration being well over double the original attempt. I could still see a little bit of curling on the overhangs, but it was much improved and I kept on coming back to check, slowly becoming more and more confident that the print might finally succeed. And then the print failed anyway. Frustrated, it was time to turn to something I knew would most likely work. And that something was a retraction setting called LiftZ here, but I know as Z-Hop. I put in a healthy height of 0.6 millimeters, and we can see this vertical lift reflected on the G-code preview. When printing, you'll notice that for any travel move, the model moves away from the nozzle to add clearance, but you'll also see that all of a sudden, we have a bunch of stringing introduced to the print. Despite the loss in print quality, we did improve our reliability a lot, and finally, I was able to complete E3D's overhang egg torture test. But at what cost? Z-Hop can be useful, but this increase in stringing is consistent with my previous experience. There is more that I could do to help make this print be successful. PLA is oozy, so slowing it down to let the cooling work harder would probably do the trick. But even so, I thought there had to be a better way than plain Z-Hop. Enter Diagonal Z-Hop. Let's try and understand what Diagonal Z-Hop is. And to do that, we'll show our travel moves, and as we can see, they're pointing upwards in the center, so Z is hopping up, but it's doing so diagonally. Let's break this process down with some diagrams. During our regular printing moves, we are extruding filament. And to move somewhere else, we'll retract the filament to take the pressure out of the nozzle. With a non-extruding travel move to travel to the new island, we'll then unretract the filament and continue our extrusion, building up the object. If we represent this normal travel move with an arrow, we can see it's a straight line which means if we have any plastic curled up, we're prone to collisions. Z-Hop differs in that after retracting, we now have a vertical move directly upwards, followed by the same travel move as before. We then have a vertical Z-Hop down to the original height before extrusion continues. The green arrows show the path of a Z-Hop travel movement, and as we know, stringing will be introduced. Diagonal Z-Hop brings a subtle change. 
Our travel move goes up as well as sideways diagonally with another diagonal movement down to the printing position. Represented with arrows, the path should be pretty clear. The aim is to provide the extra vertical clearance for curled up plastic, but hopefully reduce stringing because the travel path is closer to a horizontal line like we originally had. To test this idea, we need a straightforward way to modify the G-code. To do this, I've added a page to my website called Diagonal Z-Hop. Like the calibration pages, it'll give you an overview of what it does and when you might need it. But besides the explanations, the heart of the page is the post processor. Before using it, you should read the instructions, such as using traditional retraction rather than firmware retraction, making sure Z-Hop is turned off in your slicer of choice. The name might be different, but it's generally in the retraction section. Making sure your slicer is set to G90 absolute movements rather than relative movements. And beyond that, as the page says, it shouldn't really matter what firmware or slicer you're using, the post processor should still work. Step one is to prepare a print in your existing slicer. You can either paste in the G code into this field here, or conveniently, you can attach a file using this button and then click convert attach file to insert the G code into the field automatically. We then have two parameters that we need to decide on values for. The first is called diagonal Z hop height and that's how far above the normal printing height you'd like the middle of the travel move to go, and the minimum travel length to convert to a diagonal Z-hop. My first version of the post processor added the diagonal Z-hops, but also for these really small travel moves, a diagonal Z-hop was being added where it didn't need to be. So using this parameter, you can prevent the addition of a diagonal Z-hop movement if the travel move isn't longer than the distance that you enter. Once you've set these, click Process G-Code, and if you expand the box, you'll see that changes have been made, such as telling you when an existing travel move fell below your threshold and wasn't converted, and comments to indicate when the travel move has been converted into the diagonal Z-Hop parts one and two. You can click to copy this text to the clipboard, or I imagine most people will enter a file name and click download G-Code. I have tested this a lot, but as this warning says, it is experimental, and you should check the G-Code first. To facilitate that, we have a link to a great G-Code online viewer, which lets us easily drag our post-processed file, and firstly check to see that the model looks as if we would expect, and then secondly, tick the travel box, and make sure there's no strange travel movements going in completely the wrong direction. As you can see, the preview is showing us that we have diagonal Z-Hop for all of these movements between the two posts. If you're looking for more of a technical explanation for how this script works, I've added comments the whole way through my code and I've linked it below. The real question is, does it actually work? I started with the STL that I modeled for the retraction test on my calibration website. I sliced this one with all of my usual settings, high speed and no Z hop. And as you can see, there's pretty much zero stringing. Next, the same print with the only change being 0.6 millimeters of Z hop added on. We can see the three part movement for travel moves and we can also see some clear stringing introduced from this change. Finally, the baseline G-code put through the post processor to add 0.6 millimeters of diagonal Z-hop. There is some stringing, but it is much better than normal Z-hop. Next up was a 3D Benchy. The first one sliced with 0.6 millimeters of traditional Z-hop, and then a follow-up sliced with 0.6 millimeters of diagonal Z-hop. Like with the retraction test, there was some stringing, but it was significantly reduced from normal Z-hop. Back to the egg, and as you can see, it did reach the top, but it did introduce some stringing compared to standard. Perhaps a little bit less than normal Z-Hop, but you wouldn't say this print looks good. And most worryingly, some of the skinnier sections now look like zigzags, where the extrusion appears to have lost accuracy. Not exactly what I was hoping for. The added clearance was working because the print did complete, but there was still too much stringing. It was time to refine the idea. I suspected that most of the stringing from Z-Hop comes within that initial vertical movement. And with the current system, even on short moves, the movements were still close to vertical. So instead of my first idea of having the highest point midway along the travel move, I thought about an alternate version where the travel move is largely horizontal, but then drops down to the correct height once in place. So I modified the code and added a selection button to switch between traditional diagonal Z-Hop and this new alternate diagonal Z-Hop. In the preview, the result is much more subtle because the vertical move downwards isn't shown. But the change we want has taken place. We can see the first move is heading up before dropping down vertically to continue printing. So let's run the same tests again with this new version. 
we have normal travel move, normal Z hop, the previous diagonal Z hop on the left, followed by the alternate version on the right. Not much difference here. That retraction tower test is pretty simple, so how about we step it up with another 3D Benchy. On the left we have our original Z hop version versus the alternate diagonal Z hop version on the right, which has the least stringing of all of the models but still has some present. Let's turn back to the model that inspired this whole process and see how that compares. The first thing to note is that the print completed successfully. On the right we have the latest version, there is still some stringing but it's drastically reduced compared to what we had. And when we compare it to our version that used traditional Z-Hop, we can see that it's the cleanest print. And best of all, it took an hour less to print because I didn't have to slow things down so much. It still does have more stringing than a version with no Z-Hop whatsoever, but that version didn't finish so that's irrelevant. Some positive and promising results, but still not perfect. But there's only so much I can do with the JavaScript post processor versus an actual slicer. The movements we can achieve here are simple and more or less crude. And I feel like slicer software implementing this properly could create a much smoother and more nuanced path to give the required clearance, but cut down on stringing. That would also avoid situations where a series of travel moves around the outside of the part are all converted into a series of diagonal Z hops. My post processor is just not that smart. This printer also uses a freely moving belted Z axis, whereas other machines with their lead screws might be more prone to binding and that may prove to be the biggest limitation here. But I think that it is worth testing and here's where I need your help. Please follow the link to the page, read the notes and try out the post processor. More importantly, give me feedback in the comment section to let me know if this was worthwhile, how it could be improved, and if you think it should find its way into normal slicing software. Thank you so much for watching, curse this overhang egg, and until next time, happy trying new concepts with your 3D printer. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.